Great. Hi, so my name is uh, Cyril Guyot, so I'm uh, part of the uh, research organization of uh, Western Digital. And uh, today I'll uh, talk to you about this, uh, this work um, that we've been doing called the uh, HM Map, and specifically how it allows to combine some form of DRM caching in front of uh, a DAX uh, device. And I really want to emphasize that this work is actually mostly uh, Adam Manzanares, who presented at the previous um, version of this uh, conference. Okay, so here is what we'll talk about today. First, uh, we'll discuss um, the difference between I.O. and uh, memory uh, model of access. Uh, we'll look at HMMAP and its uh, design and implementation. Uh, we'll discuss a, uh, a prototype device uh, that we've been uh, uh, using uh, with uh, dual byte and block uh, access and uh, show some, uh, some experimental results. And, uh, um, and I want to spend some time at the end uh, to discuss some of the remaining challenges that we're hoping to tackle in the, in the future. Okay, first, a little bit of background on I.O. and uh, memory. Um, there's a bit of a semantic overload when people use the terms I.O. or memory, specifically because there's kind of uh, two dimensions uh, to those terms. Uh, one way they are sometimes used is to talk about the hardware uh, interface of a device. So in this case, let's say an I.O. device would be, you know, think an SSD, for example, or HDD, uh, where you're doing block accesses to, uh, to, um, uh, to this physical device uh, through some DMA interface. Uh, memory, in this case, would be uh, direct uh, loads and stores from the, from the CPU. But there's another side of uh, that coin, which is the programming model that you use with uh, various devices. And in this case, what we mean by I.O. is specifically explicit uh, I.O. calls, or read, writes, and so on. Uh, and memory is basically just the referencing pointers and doing your arithmetic directly on uh, memory regions. Uh, and when you combine those things together, uh, you see that uh, a hardware interface that's uh, block-based with uh, I.O. programming model, this is kind of a standard I.O. path that people think of. Uh, vice versa, um, let's say DRAM, which can be uh, receive loads and stores, uh, when used, um, you know, in a in a way that pointers are dereferenced or um, uh, um, instructions use direct uh, references to the to the memory, this is kind of standard memory uh, use case. Uh, and if you have a DAX device, that's also how you would typically use it. Now, uh, there are uh, ways of using a memory hardware device in a I.O. manner, for example, by uh, using block RAM disk or uh, making it into a block device through the PMEM uh, interface, and vice versa. There's a way of making a I.O. device uh, uh, into memory uh, programming model by mapping it, for example, and mapping files on that device uh, and basically uh, letting the standard uh, uh, fault handling deal with bringing in blocks or pages into the host memory uh, in a transparent manner. And what we'll focus on today is mostly on the bottom row uh, and look at kind of the interplay between those various things. Okay, so first, uh, when we look at accessing a block device or a memory uh, device, what actually happens in terms of software? So when I say block device, think uh, NVMe uh, device, for example. Uh, first, you have an application that's going to issue a, uh, an I.O., a read or write call, for example. Uh, this uh, context switches into a kernel space. Then uh, the generic block layer code will, um, uh, will but that is actually used for both um, uh, old style, slow HDDs, but also uh, kind of modern NVMe devices, will, uh, will get called. Eventually, those commands, uh, those, um, those I.O. calls will uh, translate into uh, the scheduler to potentially be reordered or uh, um, um, uh, their uh, issuance be optimized in some way, be passed down to a device driver, uh, and let's say we're talking an NVMe uh, storage device, this would be an NVMe uh, device driver which sends commands across the PCIe bus, and uh, if you look at, uh, so this is straight from the NVMe spec, the way you issue commands to a device like that is you actually post commands in a queue, uh, and then you signal to the device that uh, there are commands in the queue that needs to be executed. The device goes and executes those commands, posts a uh, completion queue uh, entry, and signals back to the host that there is a 
uh, something finished, basically. So there's a fair amount of work uh, and software work that happens when, uh, when uh, an I.O. is submitted to a block device. Uh, on the other side, when we're talking of uh, memory, uh, and there could be DRAM, but let's say PCIe MMIO device would also behave uh, essentially the same way. You have an application that dereferences a, a, a pointer, um, then the, um, the, the CPU itself, uh, memory management unit, uh, will deal with uh, translating this virtual address into a, a, a physical address and issue a physical uh, memory read-write. If this translation is not available right away uh, in the TLB, you will get a page walk. Um, and uh, a page walk uh, can be resolved if uh, the, um, uh, the page is already present in the, in, the, in the page table. If it's not, then uh, there will be some uh, uh, a page fault that will uh, be handled and decide basically whether uh, to map a page or, or not. And then return, um, uh, and of course install the PTE and return, and uh, return control to the CPU to uh, finalize the, um, uh, the operation. Eventually, this really is, uh, issues a, a hardware uh, load to a given uh, physical address, uh, and the correct um, uh, load, in the case of PCIe MMIO, will actually be done through the uh, PCIe range. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, interplay between hardware and software, but compared to what we've seen on the left-hand side of a, of a chart, uh, most of it is handled by the hardware. It's only in the case where you really have a page fault that there's software that ends up running. Okay, so we've seen kind of a difference. Now, what does it mean in terms of uh, how people traditionally have been using those devices? Well, block devices, usually people have used this interface for devices that tend to have latencies that are, say, larger than uh, 20 microseconds. Uh, whereas memory uh, uh, device usually has been for um, DRAM uh, or essentially devices with latencies that are you know, maybe up to a, a microsecond. Now. If one builds a, um, um, a, say, PCIe device that's able to handle both sides of the coin, both handle NVMe commands, but also uh, respond to uh, MMIO um, uh, um, loads and stores, then one sees that there's a lot of overhead here, and it's going to be very hard to take this down to, say, lower than a two microsecond. Essentially, there's kind of built-in uh, round trips that happen with uh, uh, dual bell and you know, transfers across PCIe and so on that are uh, somewhat incompressible uh, unless one really kind of changes fundamentally how the device is really accessed. On the other side of a coin, uh, it's possible to get uh, latency down to, say, 500 nanosecond across a PCIe bus, which is not as good as what one would get uh, on DRAM, but essentially it's, um, it, it's, it's pretty low latency. So this kind of brings the, the question, if one is going to build a device that is in the low microsecond uh, inherent latency, there's kind of a choice. Should I make this device a memory device? Should I make it a block device? Well, maybe making it a block device, there's a sufficient amount of overhead that there's a, um, there's a problem in doing that. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that there's advantages to the block device. The pages will end up being cached in, a, in the page cache, so subsequent uh, accesses to cache lines within the same page will be very fast because they will come from a, from a host DRM. Uh, in, the, in the case of a memory device, uh, there is no caching except possibly the caching that the CPU might be doing. There is no caching in DRM. And so uh, those subsequent cache lines uh, would not be cached and then you would pay again the same latency cost that you paid in the first place. So there's a a lot of, uh, a lot of considerations uh, to, to apply, and it does require some experimentation to figure out what makes sense. Okay, so what is HM Map? Well, HM Map is basically our um, uh, software, let's say, software framework uh, that allows us to um, uh, essentially provide a character device um, that uh, applications can uh, MMAP and thereby gain access to uh, bigger uh, uh, virtual address space that is backed by a device that is passed to HM map uh, and that is optionally also cached uh, with some um, uh, DRM cache. Uh, it's essentially an alternative to using, you know, let's say swap or using normal M map, um, uh, but with uh, some extra flexibility that we built uh, in there. And this is the link to the GitHub if you want to take a look at the, at the, at the code. So as I mentioned before, uh, standard MMAP uh, or, or swap approach is to uh, 
whenever um, a page fault occurs because a, a given address is not present in memory, uh, then the fault handler will basically bring the, the corresponding page that comes from the backend device into the host memory before being able to, um, um, uh, to satisfy the load or uh, store request. Uh, with a DAX device, none of that is necessary. With HMAP, we're basically allowing both of those things to potentially um, um, happen within a same range of addresses. So uh, some of those addresses might be served directly through the backend device in a DAX way, and others might be served in a uh, cached way. Okay. How is this implemented? Um, basically, it's a uh, one-core kernel module, which really implements all the core functionality of this, uh, of this uh, HMAP functionality. And then we have a, a few uh, plugins. Uh, first, there's a, a module that defines the, uh, the cache uh, a replacement poli policy we have implemented two algorithms. First one is uh, very similar to what's actually right now in a page cache, which is a LRU second chance. Uh, and the second one is a, a slightly more architecture independent uh, um, uh, algorithm, uh, which doesn't have to re rely on the access bit, essentially. Um, on the back end, we've also implemented a bunch of um, uh, support for a bunch of uh, different back ends. First one would be a DRM device. Uh, second one is a standard DAX device. Um, we've also implemented a backend that's able to use a RDMA device, a block device, standard block device, and also this uh, PCI uh, MMIO memory that I um, talked a little bit about before. Okay. How do we integrate this with applications? Well, obviously, if you have an application that does MMAP, then it's very easy. You just MMAP, instead of MMAPing whatever files you were using, now you just MMAP this uh, character device. Uh, so pretty much no change. Um, but most applications don't really allocate their own memory using MMAP. I mean, some do, but most of them are going to use malloc. Or uh, in, th in this case, for malloc, we're actually using libvm malloc. Uh, and uh, basically uh, LD preloading it in front so that uh, malloc calls go to the malloc implemented by libvm malloc. And within libvm malloc, uh, essentially VM map uses our own uh, HM map uh, and map. And uh, internally, libvm malloc is actually pretty good. Uh, it has a, um, an allocator that's pretty efficient if you compare it with a standard kind of GLFC allocator. Uh, for this test, lower is better, and we see that libvm malloc is actually a little bit better. Okay. So here are some um, uh, really micro benchmarks uh, of this kind of idea. Um, what this is showing is comparing basically using HMAP uh, versus using uh, uh, directly to the, uh, to the RAM backend. Uh, this is uh, using a backend that's just a, a local DRM. There's no, no separate device. Um, and um, in one case, we're using HMAP. In the other one, we're using basically the normal, um, uh, normal path. Um, and if you notice, on right, there's very essentially the same. I mean, lower is better on all those graphs. On right, there's little difference. Uh, and on read, um, uh, there's a little bit of a difference. We're a little bit better at low uh, number of threads. Uh, when we increase the number of threads, we can see that uh, we have some scalability is issues. We're not uh, doing quite as good as, uh, um, as the other approach. And it basically holds for also for random uh, accesses. Okay, but this is more of a sanity check uh, that things are not too far off. Um, here's what happens when you use, uh, say, low latency SSDs. So the, the first two bars correspond to a performance using HMAP. Uh, the last two bars correspond to a performance using uh, normal page cache. And the, those SSDs are just normal block-based uh, SSDs. Um, and the first and second bar, both uh, you know, first and second and third and fourth, correspond to uh, two different um, SSDs with two different latencies. If you look at random read, you can see, for example, that the first SSD, which is the blue and the green bar, is actually uh, significantly lower than the second uh, SSD, and we see it very well here. Um, again, the main point of this is to show that essentially uh, we're not too far off from uh, normal page cache on, the, on block devices, except possibly when we increase the concurrency quite a bit. So at 16 threads, for example, we can see that the page cache, which is the, the last two bars, uh, that's better, like lower, lower bar is better. And same here for uh, read sequential and also for random read. Um, we are a little bit better at uh, low concurrency, but we are worse at um, high concurrency. Okay, 
Now, let's go to slightly more interesting things. I mean, if um, some of you were here, uh, I think last year when um, Adam presented, I think some of those results were not too different. Uh, now, here is uh, some of the novelty in what we've done. Uh, so I mentioned it earlier. Now we can have essentially both a block and um, bar, so a base address register for PCIe, but a block and a PCIe MMIO uh, backend. So we have a backend that supports both the NVMe block side, but also uh, exposing its, um, its address space uh, in a um, load store way. Okay, so this is interesting because HMMAP, we, uh, we can leverage both of those. Uh, initially, we needed a test platform, so how can we model this? Well, we first started to use just host DRM because obviously host DRM, we can make it into a block if we want, and we can also, also use it uh, through loads and stores, and this is what this is showing. This is a result on a host DRM. Uh, here is the, the various uh, choices there. The blue curve is just plain um, HM map with a uh, block accesses, so treating the backend as just a block device. Uh, the second one is, again, HM map, but treating the backend as a DAX device. Uh, and the third one is reasonably interesting, is actually treating the backend as a device that is uh, write protected. So it can be accessed uh, DAX way on reads, but not on writes. Okay, and what do we see? Well, we see kind of what we would expect, which is uh, for write sequential, essentially, uh, if it's DAX, we're significantly faster because we do not have to first write to the cache before we write to the, to the backend. Uh, and the write protect is essentially the same as the not write protect because we do basically the same thing with write protect. Um, if we do reads, uh, whether sequential or random, we see that uh, the performance of HMMAP DAX is significantly better and the write pro protect is very close. The reason it's not exactly the same is actually there's history of writes that kind of um, uh, causes the, the, the content of the cache to need to be destaged, so there's a, li a little bit of extra work that needs to happen, but everything is kind of as expected here. Okay, so this is still very uh, micro benchmarky, so let's get to something maybe a little more uh, reasonable, and for that, uh, we needed to have some um, uh, prototype device that actually exposes both of those interfaces, uh, and this is what, um, th this is what we, uh, we have. Um, so this is basically a device that is a PCIe device with a, an FPGA on it and, a, uh, um, and some DRM, uh, and it gives us both those uh, interfaces. Exposes essentially every single address uh, within it, both through the block interface and through the, uh, through the bar. Uh, and on top of that, uh, we, we have the ability of tuning uh, how fast we actually want this device to be. Well, obviously we cannot make it faster than whatever is the base, uh, the base performance, which is about one microsecond, uh, but we can add some delays and basically make it act as if uh, uh, the memory was, uh, was lower. And what you see is that we get maybe seven and a half microsecond for kind of normal NVMe block accesses at, uh, at, at QDEP for one, uh, and maybe one microsecond for the MMIO latency. So there's kind of a substantial difference uh, in kind of confirms what we were saying earlier about the, um, the cost of going through the whole NVMe path. Okay, this is the device plugged into a, a normal server, and this is the main point here. You can see that now you have a bar, so this is the output of a LSPCI, if you're uh, familiar. You can see that there's a 256 gig bar, which is basically the 256 gig of DRM in the backend that's exposed both as an NVMe device and as a, um, as a bar device, okay? Okay, so what are we going to do with this? So uh, I already mentioned that we have this idea of using it through a read-only uh, mapping. Uh, the reason for looking at that is that um, it allows us to actually have a system that's going to work reasonably well with the practical implementation of uh, PCIe uh, root complexes. Uh, you may be familiar with some of the restrictions for PCIe MMIO, but by default, those are basically not uh, cacheable, uh, and if one wants to make them cacheable, uh, one has to be very careful not to do any writes, lest, uh, lest the machine crashes on basically a lot of uh, Intel uh, CPUs. So we are basically protecting all of this by making sure that the mapping is read-only. Um, and what do we do? Well, we have our HM map cache, uh, we have a backend uh, device, and we're uh, using those uh, together through uh, HM map with promotion into the cache or not. Okay, what does it look like? Uh, I, maybe I see better up there. So this is the uh, comparison between standard HM map, HM map DAX, uh, HM map write protect. So those three have already seen uh, some graphs before, um, 
and page cache and page, page cache that's a little bit more optimized for uh, random access by basically disabling um, uh, prefetching. So as you can see, uh, HMAP DAX is the lowest latency there. Um, when we do those writes, and uh, one of the reasons why writes are actually quite good is even though those are done on the on the bar, um, we are able, or the the, the CPU memory um, ma uh, uh, management unit is able to actually uh, combine writes, uh, do write combining to actually get pretty decent sequential throughput. Um, here's the problem we have on reads: is that if we do sequential reads, because it is not cacheable um, uh, on reads, we're actually getting uh, really, really slow throughput. We are basically fetching uh, one byte or uh, eight bytes at a time at a very kind of high uh, uh, round trip latency. So th this is, is quite bad. Uh, on random, however, this is fairly good. Random eight byte reads uh, have a, we've seen before, maybe one microsecond latency, uh, which is definitely significantly better than having to pull a whole page in the host DRM. Uh, like the page cache would t typically do through the block, uh, block access. So essentially, there's nothing too surprising. Uh, if you look at the right protect performance, um, this is you know, very expected. Uh, when we have uh, random reads, it behaves essentially the same as uh, normal DAX. When you have uh, sequential writes, uh, it pays the, uh, the standard penalty. OK. What happens if we use uh, uh, Again, slightly more interesting application. In this case, we implemented a very uh, simple Cocoa Hash based uh, key value store. Uh, and let's say we issue a lot of uh, get operations to this thing. And we have two alternatives. One is DAX approach to this uh, backend device. The other one is a standard page cache approach to it. And as you can see, when you reduce the, uh, using C group, for example, when you reduce the amount of um, uh, cache memory that a page cache can use, uh, you start paying big penalties because you keep having to evict um, uh, pages from the, from the page cache in order to make space for the next uh, get that you're issuing. Uh, with the MMIO approach, with the DAX approach, you don't ever have to do any of that. Um, on the other side, on the right-hand side, so higher is better, on the right-hand side, uh, of course, page cache gets better because eventually we're able to cache essentially all the, all the values in our uh, key value store end up in the host memory, and so there we don't get any extra benefit. I mean, basically, we're limited by whatever is the performance of our uh, key value store when all the data is in DRM, OK? Interestingly, um, we scale this with number of threads. It scales pretty well. I mean, uh, we expected the, uh, the page cache approach to scale pretty well. So it, as we can see, we went to 12 threads, and we, we didn't quite get a factor of 12, but we got from, uh, uh, let's say, 500,000 to 3 million uh, operations per second. Uh, and interestingly, the uh, MMIO approach uh, also scaled pretty reasonably, uh, went from uh, 140 maybe uh, operations per thousand operations per second to maybe 800 or 900 or thousand operations per second. So things works okay, work okay. Uh, let's go to something that doesn't just do loads, actually do, does uh, stores. Uh, you may be familiar with some of those uh, HPC benchmarks, the NAS parallel benchmarks. Uh, we looked at two, uh, two benchmarks, multigrid and the uh, integer sort. And uh, again, we want to compare what is the benefits of using direct mapping versus indirect mapping through, um, uh, through the page cache. Um, and unfortunately, you can see that DRAM is, so lower is better on those graphs. DRAM is very fast. Um, uh, page cache is much slower. Uh, and using the bar is even slower. And why is that? Well, this is basically due to the fact that our non-cacheable loads uh, lower the throughput really, really, really badly. So what could we do? Can we do cacheable PCIe MMIO accesses? Well, yeah, PCIe uh, uh, MMIO is not really supposed to be cacheable. I mean, it's something that, uh, that's not really supposed to be supported. But maybe, maybe many um, somewhat older Intel CPUs actually uh, do support them uh, with some caveat. Uh, first. There's no coherence uh, support, so one has to be really, really careful that um, whatever um, uh, cache lines that we pull in the, in the host CPU end up being flushed uh, out uh, in order to not have stale data later on. Um, 
And the other thing is it is not actually really workable on some of the more recent CPUs for which the default coherence uh, protocol actually uses a directory where just loads are enough to actually cause writes uh, to the directory. And since we are not supposed to do any write whatsoever to this MMIO range, uh, we basically crash the machine. So we, we, had, we have to use some slightly older architecture, let's say Haswell or Broadwell. Uh, but interestingly, now what we see is there's actually benefit from this DAX um, approach, uh, even for an application that is reasonably, um, let's say, uh, has a reasonable mix of uh, loads and stores. It's not just a very simple, simplistic test that we build ourselves. This is a NAS parallel benchmark. Okay, what about um, uh, what about an application, slightly higher level application, like an uh, in-memory key value store? Well, this is reasonably interesting. We can see that we have a page cache approach, so going through the indirect way, so we always bring pages in uh, to the host memory whenever, uh, uh, when, whenever a page is not present, or the uh, HMMAP approach where we map uh, some of those pages uh, through DAX, um, and we see a substantial benefit when the latency uh, of a backend that we're emulating um, is actually uh, reasonably low. So this, the lowest we're able, able to emulate is one microsecond, and we get maybe a factor of two gain in performance compared to using the normal page cache. Okay, of course, this is worse than what one would get if everything was in DRAM, which is the green dot that you can see here. But this is a pretty substantial gain. So this is interesting. Okay, now let's look at um, what are the remaining challenges for um, the, uh, HMMAP. So the first problem is in order to determine uh, what pages we want to map directly, what pages we want to bring into the, the, the cache, we have to build essentially a heat map of pages and have some idea of um, what is likely to be the future uh, need for uh, cache lines within that page. So uh, th there are features that can be used, like the uh, idle page tracking, which is a, uh, allows building essentially a heat map, but it's quite inefficient because we only really get one bit of information. Either the page has been accessed since last time we made a pass, and we know it has been accessed once at least, uh, but we don't really know. It might have been accessed a thousand times and we see no real difference. And it has another issue, which is, um, we wanted to implement this as a separate uh, user space daemon, uh, but the interface is quite slow. Uh, so just going through the whole process at rest space and basically asking for tr um, idle page tracking um, takes a fair amount of time. We're not able to do that within, say, uh, half a second. So it's a, it's a little bit problematic. So what we've been doing is implementing this essentially in kernel and do something similar to what's already being done in, a, in, a, in, pa in the page cache, in the normal page cache. Um, we've considered a few alternatives. One would be to use performance counters where, when those are available. Uh, the nice thing with performance counters is we would have a lot more uh, information, so we'll know really whether a given page is actually uh, quite, uh, it's been used many, many times since last time we looked at it. Um, but it has an issue, is that uh, we've basically seen always some associated performance impact uh, pretty much no matter how rarely we look at them. So there's, a, there's kind of um, a bit of a dilemma here. We have um, one approach that doesn't really have any overhead, but um, that is a little bit inconvenient uh, using the idle page tracking, and another one that would be very precise, but that does bring a, a performance impact. So maybe there are other approaches, but uh, so far we haven't found any. Okay. Oops. Here's another uh, challenge. Um, should the device memory really assume that it has track pages? Uh, first, why would we want to have track pages? I mean, they are very useful for the idle page tracking mechanism, of course, uh, because it's where essentially uh, information that a given page is being tracked and, has been, uh, and there has been a pass through that page uh, is kept. Uh, it also has another benefit, is that it's a, it's a nice place to put locks, for example, if one wants to specifically lock a given page. So for managing concurrency of the whole system, there's, a, there's some benefit. But there's a big problem, which is if we have a really, really large backend device, uh, the footprint of just the struct pages needed in order to uh, manage that device can be quite large. Uh, 
Um, so we have some interest in trying to see whether we can get rid of um, uh, struct pages for uh, for that purpose. And uh, there's some benefit with uh, the way HMAP is currently implemented, uh, is that uh, it's kind of separate really from most of the rest of a, of, of a kernel code, so we can experiment quite a lot with uh, various ideas there. You are, of course, aware about the eternal discussion yes. on the Linux community, whether DAX should have a struct page or not. Yes, we are. Okay. And uh, we, we have been running some experiments, one way, the other, and I would say we haven't really reached a conclusion yet. Like um, everyone. <laughs> yes, this is, I, I think, still an ongoing discussion. Mm -hmm. um, might be an idea to talk to Matt Wil Wilcox about it and see what he, where he stands currently. Yeah, so um, we definitely had some discussion. I know that Adam had talked to him uh, a few times about that, and we've been tracking, yes, the, the discussion on, on that topic. Okay, uh, as we've seen earlier, there are some scalability issues with HMAP. Um, uh, we believe that the main issue is that the current locking scheme that we're using is, is quite suboptimal compared to what the, the page cache is doing. Uh, we've already improved it sub substantially compared to the initial implementation, uh, and maybe this time it's even correct. Um, so there's a, uh, there's a big question, which is do we really want to try to find something that works really well, that's correct, and that uh, basically is equal to or better to what the page cache is doing, or maybe we can just bring all of this into a, the page cache, so that's, uh, that's something we're seriously looking at, which is basically making uh, page cache use uh, uh, infrastructure similar to what uh, HMAP is, is doing. Now, it's a little bit intimidating because we really don't want to dirty too much the, the page cache code uh, and the uh, memory management uh, code. Uh, so we're looking at uh, various possible implementation ideas. Uh, if you have any suggestion, feel free to contact us. Okay. Uh, another uh, interesting direction for, for HMAP uh, is, uh, is related to peer-to-peer uh, -to -peer, uh, PCIe accesses. So um, let's say you have a, a, um, uh, an application that uses HMAP to add some uh, memory to its um, uh, virtual address space. Um, and now this process also wants to use some GPU, some accelerator, or maybe some uh, uh, network uh, card, um, and wants to be able to do some peer-to-peer -peer between the back-end device that, uh, that uh, has just been used. Um, now, there's no guarantee that the pages will actually be in the back-end device. Maybe HMAP actually brought them in the host memory. So there's uh, some amount of uh, trickiness in basically handling peer-to-peer -peer compared to what one might have been used to if everything was in the device, or obviously if everything is in the host memory, there's no peer-to-peer. -peer, but um, So we are, we're looking at ways of uh, uh, handling this uh, reasonably. Okay. So, to conclude, uh, so what we have here is a fairly convenient platform for prototyping and uh, experimenting with various uh, caching and tiering ideas for using fast devices as memory. Uh, we've uh, one of the main experiment has been around providing DRM caching for uh, devices that may be able to do DAX. We've shown that it is a workable. Uh, idea, and we even showed that there are cases where there are performance benefits for a device that's actually reasonably slow compared to what mo most people would assume as a as, as a as a DAX device. And HMAP is open source; you can get everything on that repository. And please contact us if you're interested. And that's it. Any questions? Perfect, everything was clear. <laughs> okay, thank you.